Amen. You know, when we talk about the Antichrist, when we talk about end times, the tribulation, the rapture, those sorts of topics, I think for most, it does a number of things for the believer, even the unbeliever. For some of us, it brings intrigue. For some of us, uh, we look at it as this, uh, this interesting, mysterious topic and study. For some people, man, when we talk about the book of Revelation or these sorts of things, it's unsettling. Uh, but it doesn't need to be. You know, the, the book of Revelation, the Bible says that those who read it, it comes with a promise. You know that, that the book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible that comes with a promise if you read it and study it. It comes with a promise from the Lord that it'll bless you and encourage you in your walk with the Lord. But today we're continuing on this topic of the Antichrist because that is what Paul is addressing. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul is writing to these Christians in Thessalonica and it's all about eschatology. It's all about the future events. It's all about the end times. And he specifically speaks about this individual known as the Antichrist. And so we'll be here today uh, talking about this. Next week, we will continue. We'll kind of wrap up. Today, we're going to be diving a little bit more into uh, portions of Scripture that identify the Antichrist. And next Sunday, we're going to be diving into our text going verse by verse, just explaining the text. And that's why we wanted to lay a good foundation before I did that. So we understand what's being said. So this Antichrist, this man that's going to arrive on the scene in the end times, this man of sin, he's called the lawless one, he's called the son of perdition, he will be the most wicked, evil, sinister, and powerful man that ever lived throughout world history. In fact, it's been said that he will be the culmination of everything, all people, tribes, false religious systems, all satanic, demonic entities that have stood against God since the beginning that will all be in the culmination of this one individual known as the Antichrist. And again, we, we answer the question, why this topic and why now? Well, look in your Bible, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 5. Look what Paul says. He says, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? These were things that Paul the Apostle was already teaching the Christians in Thessalonica. Paul was with them just a short amount of time and had to leave because of persecution. About a year later, after he planted the church in Thessalonica, Paul wrote this letter, this epistle. And about three months later, he wrote 2 Thessalonians, the epistle that we're actually studying today. And there's a few reasons why Paul wrote them. First of all, Paul wrote to them because they were enduring immense persecution. They were going through great difficulty on the outside, attacks, persecutions, and Paul wrote to encourage them. Hey, you're not, at, you're not in the end times yet. That's a future event. The second reason why Paul had to write them was that there were some in the church that were living disobedient lives according to God's word. And so Paul was actually wanting to correct them, saying, guys, you need to get right with the Lord. You need to stop playing. You need to stop uh, dabbling in sin and seek after the Lord. And the last reason why Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians is to deal with this issue of eschatology. Now, don't allow that word to scare you. The word eschatology just means the study of end times or future things. Paul wanted them to have a good biblical grasp of eschatology, the study of the end times. And so should we. And that's why here at Calvary, we go book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And so as we do that, every topic that we read in, in, in Scripture, everything about life is eventually going to come to the surface. And so our time now is focusing on this important and incredible topic. Now, the last thing, as Paul was wanting to give them clarity, Paul wanted the Thessalonians to have clarity on this topic because there was a lot of confusion. A lot of confusion over this. Let me ask in the room, anybody here ever been confused about eschatology or study of the end times? Anybody raise their hand? Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Yes. I think most of us would raise our hands and say yes. Well, the only way to remove that confusion is to be students of the Bible, to study it. Not to, not to be fearful of it, but to do our best and to read the scriptures and to walk away with clarity and understanding. And so that's what Paul was doing with this letter. Paul had to correct some wrong ideas that the Thessalonians were having. Now, he wrote 1 Thessalonians, 
And he brought up some of these topics. He talks about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4. He talked about the, that they didn't miss the, the rapture, that they didn't miss the resurrection, but there was still confusion. So why was there still confusion? I mean, I don't know about you, but I would love to have the Apostle Paul coming here today and teach us from the word, right? Would that not be cool? But even though they had the Apostle Paul, they still had some confusion. Well, why? Well, look at the first few verses. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. Paul says, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him, we ask you not to be soon, so soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by the spirit or by word or by letter as if, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Verse three, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? The day of the Lord will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Again, one of the problems was that the church in Thessalonica began to be misled. Someone came to this church and was spreading some heretical teaching. Someone came to this church and, and said that the day of the Lord had already come, that the rapture had already come. They even pulled out a letter that was certified by the Apostle Paul, but it wasn't a real letter. It was a pseudo letter. It was a fake letter. Someone like copywritten or, or, or forged Paul's signature, if you will, and told him that this letter came from the Lord. And so why, why couldn't they have, have missed the rapture? Why couldn't the day of the Lord have, have already come? Well, Paul gives them a few reasons in those verses that we just read. One Paul said that, that, hey, I already told you about the rapture and the rapture hasn't happened. But secondly, is that the day of the Lord is not for God's people. The day of the Lord is for the, is for the children of the dark. He mentions this in 1 Thessalonians 4, which we've already studied. In other words, that day, that tribulational time is judgment and wrath upon an unbelieving world. And Paul says, this is not for you. But the last reason that Paul gives here that they didn't miss the rapture or the day of the Lord, he says, is that the Antichrist has not yet come. That has to happen first. So Paul gives us some of these important order of events to happen before the day of the Lord is fulfilled. Again, look at verse three. He says, for that day, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. We'll talk about this next week. But then secondly, he says, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So before the day of the Lord comes, the Antichrist must be revealed. Now, two weeks ago, not last week, because last week we had our Mexico Mission Sunday, we had Chris Nickerson from, uh, from Chihuahua, from Lightshine, come out and share with us what God was doing. But two weeks ago, we spent quite a bit of time on a very important passage of Scripture uh, in Daniel chapter 9, known as the 70 weeks of Daniel. Now, I want to I review this a little bit for us, I'm not spending much time. So if you can, turn in your Bible to your left to the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, chapter 9. And we'll spend a little bit of time in Daniel chapter 9 today, chapter 7, chapter 8 in a moment. But I just want to quickly review what we talked about two weeks ago. It's been said, and I agree, that you cannot fully grasp or understand the Antichrist unless you become familiar with this foundational passage of Scripture in Daniel chapter 9. I believe that it lays the groundwork that everything else is built on. And so look what he says here, Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 24. And the key for us today is verse 27. But in verse 24, we read, 70 weeks are determined from, for your people and your holy city to finish the transgressions, to make an end to sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So right off the bat in verse 24, God is giving Daniel this incredible future event of what's going to happen. Three of these would be future to Daniel. They would happen five to six, seven hundred years later uh, in the time of Christ, in his day and in the time of Christ. And then three of them are yet to be fulfilled. 
These are things that are going to happen in the future. Verse 25, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be 70 weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in some troublesome times. This is really the, the, the kickoff to this 70 weeks of Daniel, uh, in, incredible events, the beginning of its fulfillment. It started with King Artaxerxes when he gave the command to Nehemiah to go and build uh, 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 Jerusalem, to build up Jerusalem once again. From that point on, started this incredible prophetic clock. And that first prophecy that we just read in verse 24, that first fulfillment would be found in the appearance of Christ when he would ride into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. From the going forth of the command to the Messiah, the Prince, that's that first portion that we read there. Verse 26, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off and not for himself and the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and that shall, and that shall be with the flood to the end of war and desolation are determined. This portion speaks of the crucifixion of Christ but then also the destruction of the temple, which is important. And then we get to verse 27, and this is kind of the key focus for us. Verse 27. Then he, this prince, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wings of abomination shall be the one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And so again, this is speaking of this man who's going to come up on the scene in the 69th week of Daniel, the last week of Daniel's 70th week Bible prophecy, this final week, this man is going to come up, and it says here that he will make a covenant with the nation for one week. Well, we, again, what we know is that one week is a seven-year period of time known as a time of Jacob's trouble, a time of tribulation. And so he was going to make this covenant. In the middle of this covenant, he's going to break this covenant with the nation of Israel. Now, again, if you weren't with us two weeks ago, that lays the foundation with the things that we're talking about today. And we don't have that much time to go through all of that because there's a lot we want to try to cover. So this is why when anytime something is happening in the Middle East— Everyone gets perked up. You know what happened a year and a half ago with Hamas killing and murdering innocent Jews there? It sparked just something in the world. Everyone's eyes was on Israel. And then all of a sudden, everyone began to get involved. Syria began to get involved. Lebanon began to get involved. Egypt began to get involved. Iran began to get involved. And Iran and Israel has had pretty much a stable relationship for the last 44 years. And for the first time after 44 years, Iran uh, actually attacked Israel. Let me tell you, the moment things like that begin to happen, it ought to stir us up to say, Lord, what are you doing? And what's happening? Because all eyes are on Israel. This idea of peace in the Middle East won't exist until Jesus the Messiah comes. Now, what we believe is that there is going to be this guy, this individual known as Antichrist, who will arrive on the scene, and he will be a pseudo-prince, a pseudo-messiah. He's going to come out of Europe somewhere, somehow, and make world peace. He is going to be the answer to all the world's problems, wars, and issues, especially in the Middle East, and he will bring a false peace that's demonically orchestrated. Now, oftentimes when we talk about eschatology, we talk about a timeline, we talk about how these events unfold, it can be a little confusing. And so we do have a timeline that we want to put up there. So can we put that timeline up there for a moment? So if you're, if you're wanting to understand what is the timeline for the for eschatology, at least from the position that we hold here at Denver Calvary. We have a pre-tribulational rapture view. That's the position that we hold. Pastor Chuck held that. We hold that. And so over here, right at the very beginning, we have the 69 weeks of Daniel Bible prophecy that we talked about two weeks ago. I mentioned a little bit of it today. Again, from that time, we go to the cross. After the cross, after the resurrection of Christ, 
There in Acts chapter two, Pentecost takes place. The Holy Spirit falls upon the church. It begins an important timeline, an event known as the church age. In the Bible, that's known as the time of the Gentiles. And that time has it started in Pentecost, Acts chapter two. And it's in, we're in the present day right now, the time of the church. That's God's modus operandi using believers filled with the Holy Spirit, his church. But that changes after the rapture. When does the rapture happen? It can happen any time. We don't know the day or the, or the hour, right? The rapture can happen at any moment on the position that we hold here at Calvary. But after the rapture is what begins this process known as the day of the Lord or the tribulational period. It will be a seven-year period in which the Antichrist will arrive on the scene. It'll be seven years long. And in the middle of that tribulational period, in the middle of that commitment that he will make with Israel, according to Daniel chapter nine, verse 27, he is gonna break a covenant with them. And then that starts another timeline. It starts another clock known as the time of Jacob's trouble or the great tribulational period. That happens for three and a half more years. And then we have the second coming. Christ coming back. When Christ comes back, he's going to establish his reign here on earth, known as the millennial reign. And then after the millennial reign will be the new heaven and new earth. Now that's, I'm wrapping that up in like, you know, a minute, but that's an extensive topic. But I wanted to give you guys a visual of what, what that looks like, what we, what we see happening here. So it's time for us to buckle up a little bit because we're going to leave Daniel. We're going to leave Thessalonians, and we're going to jump in the book of Revelation. So open up your Bible to Revelation chapter 6, or turn in your Bible, I should say, to Revelation chapter 6. Again, our topic today is who is the Antichrist, or uh, the coming Antichrist. And so this is part two. If you missed the first uh, portion, I encourage you to go back and listen to that. And next week, we're going to dive into our, our text and explain our text. When we get into Revelation chapter 6, it's important for me just to lay a few things out. And Revelation chapter 1, uh, the revelation of Jesus is given to John the Apostle. He's on the island of Patmos. He's given this revelation. It is a revelation of Jesus. Not the Antichrist, not the Great Tribulation, not the New Roman Empire. It's all about Jesus. The book of Revelation is about Jesus. It's meant to orientate the church's eyes to say, look to Jesus. When we get into Revelation chapter two, chapter three, what we see is that Jesus begins to speak to the churches. Churches that existed there in Asia Minor, but also churches, I believe, that represent a timeline of history. When we get into Revelation chapter four, I think there in verse one and verse two, that we see John taken, he's caught up into heaven. And I believe that that is symbolic of the rapture. Why? Because when you get into Revelation chapter 5, you have the church now in heaven, worshiping at the end of chapter 5. Now, in chapter 5, chapter 4 and chapter 5, we know that John sees the throne of heaven, angels running around saying, saying, holy, holy. And there on the throne, he sees a scroll that no one can open on heaven or on earth. That is until Jesus comes, the Lamb of God, the Son of David comes. He grabs the scroll and he begins to open up the seal. Only Jesus could do this. It is the revelation of himself. And then once you get to Revelation chapter 6, it is the unveiling of that seal, that revelation of Jesus. And I believe from Revelation 6 all the way to Revelation 19 is you have the tribulational period of time that takes place. And so here we are in Revelation chapter six. Let's, let's look at just a few, uh, a couple of verses there, starting in verse one and verse two. It says, now when I saw the lamb open one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with the voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown And it was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. What we have in Revelation chapter 6, in those first 10 verses, which we're not going to study in depth, we're just looking at these two verses, 
we have here in Revelation 6 four mysterious writers known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. How many of you guys ever heard that? The horsemen of the, yeah, it's well known. In fact, there's a famous painting that was created in 1887 by Victor Vanestov, and it shows these four horsemen that came, death, famine, war, and conquest. And these four horsemen are gonna do God's bidding here on earth. They are gonna come to bring judgment and God's wrath here on earth. They're gonna bring, they're gonna usher in what's known as the tribulational period. Tribulational period will be, if you don't know, a seven year period of time. It's a future event where God will finish his discipline to the nation of Israel, but also will finalize his judgment on an unbelieving world. We believe here at Calvary that the church will be removed from this, that we will be raptured prior to this event of the tribulation. We see this for Thessalonians chapter four. We see this for Corinthians chapter 15, uh, John chapter 14. And so this tribulational period is known as the day of the Lord. This is what Paul is addressing in 2 Thessalonians chapter two, okay? This will be known as a time of, of great trouble, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, a time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. And so as we're introduced to these four horsemen of the apocalypse, we're introduced to the first one, and this is the one we're going to look at as it applies to our text in 2 Thessalonians. Look at it with me again, verse 1. It says, now, when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the voices of the four living creatures saying, with a voice like thunder, come up and see. And I looked and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it held a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, we look at this, and we see again the lamb, this is Jesus, opening the first seal that I just described in Revelation chapter 5. And John, the apostle, is witnessing this, and he writes down everything that he sees. And so what, what is it that John sees as this seal is open and this is unleashed? Well, he sees first a horse and then he sees a horseman. But notice the attributes that we see here in verse 2. He had a white horse. He had a crown. He has a bow. And we read that he went out conquering and to conquer. So one of the first questions that's asked when we read this is who is this? Who is this individual that John is seeing, that this, this unveiling has happened, the seal is broken, and this individual is given permission to do what they are going to do? You know, at first glance, some people might think, well, this is Jesus, right? I mean, come on, guys, he's on a white horse, right? But the reality is that is where the comparison starts and ends. There is no other comparison. In fact, I'll give you some quickly. This individual shows up at the beginning of the tribulation. While we read in Revelation 19, Jesus shows up at the end of the tribulation. This individual has a single crown. But in Revelation chapter 1, we read that Jesus has many crowns, multiple crowns. This individual has a bow. But the scripture says that Jesus comes back with a sword and a scepter. This, this individual's MO, modus operandi, uh, is to conquer and to conquest. But when Jesus comes back, he will come back to judge, redeem, and restore. This individual in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, is a pseudo-messiah. This individual is a fake. They are an imposter. And yes, they will come on a white horse, and the people of the world will take the bait and they will be fooled. This is none other than the Antichrist himself. And this is how he is revealed. This is where the beginning of the tribulation begins, the day of the Lord begins, and this is what the Antichrist will do. He will come to deceive the world. Now, again, you don't have to turn there, but let me just read again a portion from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. It says this. Let's put it up on the screen if we can. Thank you. It says, and the coming of the lawless one is one, is, is, lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, 
lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So he comes riding in on a white horse. Outwardly, he looks like a hero. I mean, that's pretty much what we get, right? Ever since we were young, the hero always shows up on a white horse while the bad guy is always on a black horse. Am I right? Right? Again, those that came in conquering, those rulers of the ancient days, they would come in on a white horse. They come in as a hero, a savior, a helper, or a deliverer making peace. But we read that he also comes with a bow. And a bow is symbolic of strength and position and action. He comes with a crown, speaking of authority and power. This was given to him that we'll read later on. He will have amazing supernatural ability that is demonically inspired. He will have demonic talent, ability, charisma, charm, and he will win the hearts of the people. And lastly, what do we read about this? This individual in Revelation 6, verse 2, is that he comes to conquer. This will be his modus operandi. He will have all the answers that have never been answered, and he will win the hearts of the people, and the people will yield themselves, and he will conquer all. Again, you look at this, and you think, man, this just seems like an impossibility. This seems like just some type of Bible story. But guys, let me just tell you, just a half century ago, this happened. This already kind of took place. Something like this already happened. It started with this guy that came to the scene, rising to power, his name, Adolf Hitler. When he rose to the power, again, the Western allies thought that he would be a man of peace. Especially the prime minister of Great Britain at the time. Again, that was Neville Chamberlain. He actually met with Hitler in Munich. And coming back, he came back with a signed declaration, a piece of paper that Hitler declared peace. In fact, written on that was the statement, peace with honor, peace for our time. But there was one individual who saw right through the facade of Adolf Hitler. His name was Winston Churchill. He said, don't trust him. The guy is bad news. But by the time that voice began to be listened to, it was too late as they, the world figured out, and it was plunged into World War II. Again, we'll talk about Hitler in a moment, but the guy commanded millions of people, murdered millions of people, and all eyes of the world were on him. This is going to happen again in even a greater state with this individual known as the Antichrist. Again, listen to what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. We'll put it on the screen. Paul says, for when they say peace and safety then sudden destruction comes upon them. As labor pains upon a pregnant woman, they shall not escape. Anybody here ever have a baby? A few, thank you. Only like two, three people, that's it. I had a baby. My wife had the baby, but I was with my wife, okay? And I remember when we were pregnant with each of our kids, as her belly began to grow, she began to have contractions. And she, I could tell because she would have this grimace on her face and she'd be like, oh man, oh. And she would feel the birth pains coming. Well, as we were getting closer to the event, that little baby coming, those contractions began to increase in number, began to be shortened in, 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 to one another, and they began to grow in intensity. And what, what, Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.3 is that it will be that way as the Antichrist arrives on the scene. So in Revelation 6, we get our, the first picture of the, of the Antichrist in the book of Revelation in the tribulation. But there's a lot to know about this individual. Turn to your right with me to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. The Antichrist will be sensational. One of the names of the Antichrist is the beast, which is revealed here in Revelation chapter 13. Look what it says. Let's read verses 1 through 10, and then we'll come back and expound that. It says in verse 1, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven horns, seven heads, excuse me, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, 
and on his head a blasphemous name. Now, the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, Satan, gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. And so they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given uh, given authority to continue for 42 months. That's three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. That's huge whose name has not been yet written in the book of life, the life of lamb, the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, one of the things that we discussed, we went through, it took us almost two years to go through the book of Revelation and uh, we went, back, went through the book of Revelation back in 2019, and it's on our website. You can go and listen because we go into depth over these passages. But one of the things that you have to be prepared for when you start studying eschatology, um, whether it's in the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, or the book of Revelation, is you must deal with symbolism that you find in scriptural, Scripture. There is symbolism. There is Jewish imagery in the book of Revelation. There are a lot of these areas that you have to grasp and that is the challenge oftentimes when you study to try to come away with a proper and correct interpretation of such things. And so there's, there's this interpretation that we want to grasp, with understanding we want to grasp in Revelation chapter 13. And we see this imagery here. Now remember, John is given this vision in the book of Revelation chapter 1. And he's writing these things down as he sees these things unfold. He's He's writing, he's documenting, and he's sharing with us to understand. Now, the first thing that we see in Revelation 13, verse 1, is that he is standing on the sand of the sea. And he sees his beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns, and, and, and on his heads a blasphemous name. So he's standing on the seashore. Now, this parallels with other portions of Scripture that we're not going to dive into because we just don't have time. But you can go back and read Daniel chapter 7, because Daniel 7 correlates with this very moment here. And you can write that down and go back and read it. So what does it mean that he's standing by the sand of the sea? Well, the seas literally represent the nations. It speaks to people, the sea of humanity, People across the globe. Now, right off the bat, I know what you're going to say. Pastor Louis, okay, where do you come up with that? You know, did he pull that out of the hat? No. The Bible actually explains this to us. And a couple of chapters later in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, if we can put that up on the screen. Revelation 17, 15, the waters which you saw, this is getting the explanation, where the harlot sits are the people, the multitudes, nations, and tongues. Guys, you know, oftentimes when you're studying Bible prophecy, you just got to read. You read through. And so Revelation actually explains uh, what we're seeing here. And so John, he stands by the sea, and he sees the, the entire world, if you will, and this beast rising up out of this. Now, we notice right off the bat in verse 1 that he has these seven heads, ten horns, ten crowns. Each of these are meant to be symbolic and have significant meaning for us. But there are two basic principles that we get out of these, uh, these imagery that we get in Revelation is that it speaks to political rule and it speaks to having sovereignty. When the Antichrist arrives, he will have authority and power and sovereignty to rule as he wishes. And again, he will be a world ruler. Again, the horns and the crowns, they simply represent that dominion and authority that's given by man. 
And so this Antichrist that we are studying about in 2 Thessalonians 2 will be a powerful world ruler. Now, you notice when we look here that he has not just uh, one head, but several heads. So again, you picture the imagery is crazy. This beast coming out, it's almost like this multiple head type of creature. But these several heads uh, have several horns and several crowns. Now these heads and these horns, it's important to grasp, these crowns don't all belong necessarily to one individual like the Antichrist, but they represent world leaders, political figures that will give the beast authority and power. These are other world leaders that are on the scene giving the Antichrist authority and power in position. Again, how do we know this? Revelation 17, verses 12 through 13. Can we put that on the screen? It says, The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will be given, they will give their power and authority to the beast. Again, I love how scripture interprets scripture, right? That's not doesn't mean that complicated. So these are going to be rulers that will bend the knee and bow themselves to this individual known as the Antichrist. And it's interesting because as you study about the Antichrist, what you learn is that basically there's going to be this confederate, unified, new world empire that has this leader and this ruler that will be the Antichrist. And all these other leaders will be under his hand and direction and be submitted to him. Revelation 17, 3 tells us that they are of one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast. Again, back to Revelation chapter 13. Again, we have these seven heads, they're rulers and leaders. There's 10 horns, it speaks to nations and powers, and there's 10 crowns, speaking to authority, power, and dominion. Now, one thing you see at the very end of verse 1 of Revelation 13, verse 1, it says, and on his heads are blasphemous names. The Antichrist will stand against two main individuals that we read in, in the tribulation. Number one, against anything that has to do with Christ. So any believers that are here on earth. But secondly, he will stand greatly against the nation of Israel. He will oppose the nation of Israel. And so this sensational individual, he will dominate the world. And again, you, we ask the question, Louis, that sounds sensational. That sounds extreme. Is that even possible? The answer is absolutely. Again, some today look at the EEC. The European Economic Market, it was established back in 1957 as a treaty for these, companies, these countries to work together. This is right now a confederate of nations that are moving uh, both uh, goods and capital and services that they might work together. And back in 1999, I don't know if you remember this, how big of a deal this was, they established the euro. You guys remember that? That was something that many, uh, those that were looking to Bible prophecy began to think, man, this is Bible prophecy happening where these countries are now coming together. And so again, we ask the question, how will this happen? Well, the Antichrist will be the leader of this empire, this unifying of the nations. And this individual will be just sensational. It's often asked, what will the Antichrist be like? How could such a man control everything, lead everything, and even rise up to power? Well, let me give you a quick list of all the different attributes that we have from Scripture that relates to the Antichrist. I'm going to be quick about this, so you, it might be hard to write this down, but let me give you the, the characteristics you find in Scripture. In Daniel chapter 8, we are told that the Antichrist will be an intellectual genius. Daniel chapter 11 tells us he will be an oratorical genius. Revelation 17 tells us he will be a political genius. Daniel chapter 11, along with Revelation 13, says he will have commercial genius. Revelation chapter 6 and chapter 13 tells us that he will be a military genius. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and 3 tell us that he will be a religious genius. Psalm 2, Daniel 11, Revelation 13 tells us that he will rule the nations, all the nations in the world. Revelation, uh, or, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians 2 tells us he will be the master of all deceit. 
Revelation 13 tells us he will be empowered by Satan himself. Again, what we have read and looked at and talked about describes what Daniel speaks of, of a new Babylonian empire, a new Roman empire that is to come. It will be financially viable, have military might, commerce control. It will solve world issues. And it will be led by this individual known as the Antichrist. Again, I don't know about you, but when I would hear things like this, I would just go, okay, simmer down, pastor. You're getting a little preachy on me, getting sensational. This seems far-fetched, but it really isn't. How many guys remember David Koresh? Yeah, David Koresh. He was a false Christ. He had only about 50 followers, right? But then you have uh, Charles Manson. He had about 100 followers. How many guys remember Jim Jones? He had about 1,000, I think about 900. Hitler. Do you know how many people followed Hitler? 18 million. 18 million people were under his control. He also had the support of other countries like Japan and Italy backing him up. Guys, it's not so far-fetched as we, as we could see. Now, there are a couple of portions of Scripture I want you to turn to that gives us more descriptions about the Antichrist. So turn back to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 8. I apologize if I'm talking very fast. I apologize if I'm going through this quickly. But, guys, this is weeks and weeks of worth of material that we're trying to cram in to just a, a couple of weeks here. But back in Daniel chapter 8, I want to show you a little bit about the Antichrist here. <clears throat> Daniel 8, starting in verse 23. Daniel 8, verses 23 down to verse 27. Look what it says. And in the latter times of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully, and he shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. And through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. <clears throat> He shall be broken without human hand. Again, that's by the Lord himself. Verse 26. And the vision of, of the evening and the morning which was told to us is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. And afterward, I arose and went, out, went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Again, this is given to Daniel. Five to 700 years before Jesus. Turn to Daniel chapter 11 now. Daniel chapter 11, starting in verse 23. Daniel 11, starting in verse 23, down to verse 27. And it says, after the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully. For he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people. And he shall enter peaceably, even into the richest places of a province, and he shall do what his fathers have not done, nor his forefathers have done. And uh, verse, uh, he shall, dis he'll, he shall disperse among them the plunder, the spoils, the riches, and he shall devise his plans against the strongholds, but only for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with great army, and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a great and mighty army, and he shall stand, for they shall devise plans against them. Yes, those who eat of the portion of his delicacy shall destroy him. His army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down. Both these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies to the same table, and shall prosper at the end of, and still be at the appointed time. Look at verse 20, 36. Then the king shall do exceeding, shall do according to his own will. 
and he shall exalt and magnify himself above every God. Listen to this, this is key. He shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods and shall prosper until the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done. Listen to this, verse 37, this is very interesting. And he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above them all. But in their place he shall honor a God of fortress and a God which the fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Verse 39, thus he shall act against the strongest fortress with a foreign God, which shall be acknowledged and advanced its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land and the gain. Again, one of the things the Antichrist will seek to do is demand everyone to worship him. Now, this is what we're going to look at a little bit next week is how the Antichrist will set himself up as God and demand everyone to worship him, which is interesting. In fact, if you could turn to Revelation chapter, back to Revelation chapter 13. Back to Revelation chapter 13. A few more things that we want to point out. There in verse 2. It says, Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet was like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne in great authority. Again, this parallels the book of Daniel. If you guys remember, in the book of Daniel... Daniel was given these incredible visions of the future. He was given a, a, a visions of the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and the Roman Empire. And then he was given one additional vision of an empire that was yet to come that would look like the Roman Empire. And they're given these same features and descriptions. Again, the Babylonian Empire was like a lion, fierce and majestic. The Medo-Persian Empire was like a bear, strong and powerful. The Grecian Empire was like a leopard with speed. But then this new one, again, will be all rolled into one together. Now, notice in verse 2 what it says at the end of verse 2. It says, the dragon gave him his power and his throne in great authority. The reason why the Antichrist will have such ability is because it's demonically inspired by Satan himself. Now, one of the things that's speculation is what you find in verse 3 of Revelation 13. Look what it says in verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. You know, one of the speculations that is often given with this passage of Scripture is that some believe that there will be an assassination attempt against the Antichrist in which his buddy, the false prophet, will seek to resurrect him. And it's at that point that he performs that which is called the abomination of desolation, requiring the world to worship him and receive a mark, the mark of the beast, the mark of Six, six, six. Again, we read these things, guys. We read this about the Antichrist, and it is mysterious. It is interesting. It is challenging. It can even be a little scary. You know, we ask the question, who is the Antichrist going to be? Is the Antichrist even here now? Now, I, I believe that quite possibly the Antichrist could be here right now, being raised up in one of these European countries arriving on the scene politically, ready to step in as things begin to fall apart. Some say, well, it, it, it might be Putin. I don't think so. Some people go to the extreme, well, I think it's going to be the Pope. I don't think so. You know, there's an old phrase, and I think it's true. You might have heard this. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds what? The future, right? I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. Who's that? The Lord. You see, here's what's key. When we read Bible prophecy, you have to understand the one who gave it, the Lord. It is the Lord who has given it to us to bring clarity, understanding, comfort, faith, assurance in his word. 
Again, these future things are not to get our eyes on the Antichrist. It's not to get our eyes on the, the prophetic things that are mysterious and even scary. No, the Bible makes it clear. Church, you must get your eyes on Jesus. He is the key. It's not the revelation of the Antichrist, not the revelation of the beast, not the revelation of the false prophet. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us and says, we need to look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And that is the purpose of these revelations, is for us as the church to get our eyes on Jesus. And Paul, when he wrote 2 Thessalonians, was wanting to encourage that church, saying, guys, listen, you didn't miss the rapture. It's still coming. You didn't miss the day of the Lord. It's still coming. And before those things happen, these are the things that must fall in place. Now, next week, when we're back here, we're going to break down 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, go verse by verse, and explain the things that Paul is speaking to them about. So let me ask you today, what are you looking towards today for your hope? What are you looking towards today for your peace or your comfort? I pray that you turn and look to Jesus. Because if it's not Jesus, then it's on the wrong path.